you, Jesus. Let's say together the word of God is sweet and powerful. It will set me free and give me victory. So I'll open my heart and I'll receive the word. If you believe it, put your hands together for the Lord one more time. It's worthy of praise. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And so, Lord, I testify that Jesus heals and Jesus saves. Father, I thank you for the privilege to preach your word again. Lord, please stretch forth your hand to, to heal and to save. Comfort the afflicted and encourage the weak. Holy Spirit, please rest upon me as I lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Can we thank the Lord one more time? Father, we are worthy, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated, please. We are entering our second week of fasting and prayer today, amen? Are we excited about that? We are fasting from physical food. But the good news is that we, we are feasting on spiritual food that is prepared directly from the kitchen in heaven, amen? We are fasting from early food, but we are feasting on God's word and feasting on prayer. This week, we're going to have some more feasting every single day, amen? Uh, Job, Job uh, 23 and 12 says, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily food. I have treasured the word of God more than my daily food. So uh, Job knew the value of feasting on the word of God, which is what we're doing uh, all this week. It is wonderful to feed on divine food for 21 days. That's a wonderful treat, amen? David also said in Psalm 19 and, and 10, David said, uh, the word of God is sweeter than honey. And so we are fishing on something that is much sweeter than honey. We, we are losing some physical calories, but, but we are gaining uh, spiritual calories in the process, Amen. And, and that's what fasting and, and praying is all about. We, we gain some spiritual color, some strength, spiritually. There, there's so much value in what we are doing. Our strength is being renewed right at the beginning of the year so we can, we can take on the rest of the year. Now, the Bible says us in Isaiah 40 and 31, the Bible says, those who wait on the Lord, those who wait on the Lord, those who take time to seek the Lord. And so, Lord, I'm tired of the same old sin. I'm tired of the same old result. I'm, I'm tired of the same old struggle. I'm tired of the same old thing. And so, Lord, I'm waiting on you these 21 days. And the Bible says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they will not faint. So waiting on the Lord is a definite game changer. That there are times when we get weighed down by the ups and downs of life. We simply get exhausted. In the past two years, needless to say, uh, have been very, very exhausting because of the pandemic and all the uncertainties that uh, the pandemic has unleashed. It's been spiritually exhausting. It's been mentally exhausting. It's been emotionally exhausting. It's been physically uh, exhausting. And, and many lives have been broken. But when we take time to wait upon the Lord as we're doing this 21 days, the Bible says our strength will be renewed and we'll run and we won't even be exhausted. We'll, we'll walk and we'll not faint. In fact, the Bible says that not only shall we be renewed, but we shall even mount up with wings as eagles. Amen? We simply won't be satisfied with just uh, walking and running. 
will actually begin to mount up with wings like eagles because we have been supernaturally energized by the power of God. And I want us to believe together that this will be a very glorious year. As I said last week, I want us to contend for every blessing that God has ordained for us. I want us to, to contend for it. I want us to, to fight for it. You see, sometimes you have to fight for the promises. It's as simple as that. And, and it's right in the Bible. There are times when you have to fight for them. You have to contend for them, especially when the enemy knows that you know, there's going to be a difference when those blessings become a reality, when those promises become a reality, he will fight, and you've got to fight back for those promises. And that's why Paul said to Timothy in Timothy 1.18, he said, Timothy, my son, Timothy was a pastor. Paul knew him. Paul was the one who trained him. And he looked at Timothy, and he said, Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies that were once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. You may fight the good fight. Fight, Timothy. Remember the promises that, that were made for you. Remember what God said to you. Remember what God said he was going to use you for. But you have to fight for it. Recall them and let those prophecies energize you as you remember them to fight a good fight. So sometimes we have to fight to attain the promises that God has given us because we, we are engaged in a spiritual warfare. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 and 12 that we wrestle not against our flesh and blood, but against principalities and against our powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world. We, we, we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in the heavenly places. And so we need to fight these wicked forces who seek to bless, uh, to block our blessings, we fight with spiritual weapons. We are also reminded in Second Corinthians uh, ten. You look at thirty-four. The Bible says, "For though we live in the world, though we live in this physical world, we do not wage war as the world does." If you want to fight with, with you know, with, with with your speech and you know, uh, angry retorts and those kinds of things because of things that you experience, you're going to lose. And so, even though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And so, only spiritual weapons can ensure that you and I have the victory that God intends for us to have, amen? And so we, we must fight with every special weapon at our disposal to ensure that we accomplish every assignment and receive every single blessing that God has for us. That is why this time of fasting and prayer is so critical. And I can't thank God enough for that. I mean... Uh, every year, I get excited about the fasting prayer. I, I just get excited about it because I know the value of it. And so my prayer is that every single one of us will be in it to receive the entire benefits that God has for us. Amen? Waiting on the Lord results in a renewal of our strength so that we can overcome the inevitable challenges uh, of life. We, we are pulling down strongholds and then paving the way for our, matu our blessings to, to materialize. Let me say uh, that it is uh, vitally important, it is vitally important that we exercise our faith as we fast and pray, uh, as we, 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 we you know, get into this time of fasting and prayer and you know, use our spiritual weapons and all those things, believing that certain things will happen, it is important that we exercise our faith. The Bible says in Mark 9 and 23, all things are possible to him who believes. So it's important that we exercise our faith as we fast and pray and believe that God will do what he said he will do. It is wonderful to wait on the Lord, but it is equally 
critically important to believe that God will do what you are believing that he will do for you, that it will come to pass, that it will happen. If there's no faith, then there will be no result for us to see. You know, David says in Psalm 5 and 3, David said, In the morning, O Lord, I lay my request before you and I wait in expectation. I wait because I have faith. Waiting in expectation means that you wait in faith. It means you have a spirit of expectancy uh, within you. It means you are, you are pregnant with hope that, you know, any day now there will be a release of your blessings from heaven. I want to encourage everyone, you know, to sound strong and believe God that any day now, the blessing that you've been looking for will be released. Amen? Any day now. Listen, today could be your day for your breakthrough. I want make sure that's why it's so important to, to come into the house of God believing. Today could be the day for the breakthrough that you've been waiting all along. In fact, this very moment could be your moment. The, the Bible tells us a story in Acts chapter 14 that uh, the Apostle Paul was at a place uh, called Lystra and, uh, and he was preaching. And the Bible says there was a man in the congregation who was listening as, as Paul was preaching. And Paul looked intently at that man just during the time of the sermon and then he realized that this man had faith to believe. The man was crippled. He had never walked from birth. He was crippled from birth. And there he starts listening to Paul preaching. The Bible says Paul connected with the man's faith. He saw that the man had faith. Just as you are, believe, you are receiving, you are hearing the word right now. If your faith is coming forth, the Holy Spirit knows and sees that and he can release your blessings. So immediately, Paul said to that man, get up on your feet. And the, man, the Bible says the man immediately jumped on his feet and started walking. So today could be your moment. If you believe it, put your hands together uh, for the Lord. Amen. And so ignite your faith to receive what God has in store for you. Whatever disappointments you encountered last year is not the end of the story. God is still on the throne. God can do it these 21 days. And so let's say, Lord, do it again for you are able. Lord, do it again. Believe God and say, Lord, I'm believing you to do it again. Lord, do it again because you've done it in the past and I know you can do it. You've never failed. You've never lost a battle. You are a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that I'm asking or thinking, according to your power that is at work in me. So, Lord, I'm trusting you and I'm believing you to do it again. Do it again, Lord, for you are more than able. Isn't our God an awesome God? No, somehow, I'm very excited about this year. I can't explain it, but I'm just really excited. I don't know what God is going to do, but I'm just excited. I sent a friend of mine... Um, a New Year's message uh, to bless him. You know, I would normally send out uh, messages to people, and so I sent him a message uh, just to, to bless him, a, a fellow pastor, you know, someone that I care about. And um, he uh, sent me a blessing back. Uh, and this is what he, he said in his text back to me. May this be your best year ever. May this be your best year ever. And so I responded back to him, we receive it. I believe we'll have a testimony to share with you by the end of this year to that effect. And then he texted back, amen. Which simply means I'm agreeing with you. That evening, those of you who were on the prayer line, uh, that evening when I was praying, that was Monday. So at the end of the, of the, you know, of the prayers, when I was concluding, uh, I just uh, simply uh, felt that I should release the same blessing. I then thought about it. 
but it was just in my heart. And so, and so I, I blessed those on the line. And I said, may this be your best year ever. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 18 and 21 that the tongue has the power of life and death. There, there are times when God will prompt someone to speak to you or to say something. If you are in tune with the spirit, you realize that that's not just something that has been said, but that's something that the Holy Spirit intends for your life. And so immediately, I knew there was something coming. That's why I received it. And when I felt the prompting to re- release it, I didn't even hesitate. You see, the Bible says in Proverbs 18.21 that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so the things we say are powerful. They, they carry weight. The Bible says that the prayers of a righteous person are powerful and they are effective. The Bible also says in Proverbs 22 and 28 that you will declare a thing. You will declare a thing and it shall be established. I mean, think about it. When, when you make a declaration and you, you are speaking under the, the power and the inspiration of the spirit of the living God, the Bible says when you say that thing, it will be established. And so even now, may I pray for you that may this be your best year ever. May this be your best year ever. Amen. May, may this time of fasting and prayer yield incredible blessings. If you receive it, let's put our hands together uh, for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. All right, let's get into our sermon for the day. Our theme for the year is, Oh Lord, revive us. And I want you to, to note the, the order of, of, of the words. Oh Lord, revive us. And all week long, I've been thinking about it. Oh Lord, revive us. Notice that it starts with, Oh Lord. And, and so the focus is on the Lord. He is a source of everything. He's a source of the revival. So, oh Lord, revive us. God is the source of every revival. That's why we spent the first week of the, of the time of fasting and prayer to seek the Lord, to draw close to him. Because he's the only one who can give us what we're looking for. Now, as I mentioned last week, I want each of us to focus on being personally revived, look up unto the Lord and, and ask the Spirit to change you, ask the Spirit to revive you. That, that's where everything comes from. And so it will be personal revival so that we can enjoy the blessings that accompany a genuine revival. Last week we had a message uh, entitled, Oh Lord, Revive Me. We made it very personal. Oh Lord, Revive Me. The title of our message today is, the environment for revival. The environment for revival. What things must be in place for us to expect a revival? Now, we mentioned last week that revival at this rule simply means to, to live again. It also has the concept of, of, of making something new. So when we talk about revival, uh, we are causing things to, to come back to life, to live again, and then really to make things are new. And so, a true spiritual revival will shift our mindset to a totally new way of thinking and a totally new way of living. A true revival is a life-changing encounter with God. It will never leave you the same as you came. We also mentioned that Given the state of the world today, nothing short of a true revival can change the pain and the suffering that we're experiencing because of the wickedness of the human heart. We need God to show up. And that is why the prophet cried out in Isaiah 64, look at 1 and 2, the prophet cried out, oh, that you rend the heavens. is one of our, our, our theme passages for the year. Oh, that you rend the heavens and come down. Lord, that you tear up the heavens and just come down. 
and that the mountains will tremble or they will quake before you. We need you to come down. Just rend the heavens. Just tear it apart and come down. Things are so bad that, Lord, we need you to rend the heavens and come down. As when fire sets tricks ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down in your power like fire and set things ablaze. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake at you, to quake before you. We need God to show up. Today, I want to focus on the environment, what needs to happen, what, what, what is needed for a true revival to happen. I want to mention four things. We'll only have time to look at the first one uh, because of our time, and then we'll conclude next week. But let me mention the four things. Number one, Acknowledging our sins. Acknowledging our sins. Number two, a willing person. A willing person. Number three, prayer. And number four, God's way. Now, when these four things are present, we can expect God to bring a revival. Let's start with the first one uh, today, and then we'll, we'll conclude uh, next week. Acknowledging our sins. Is it? There can be no true revival unless we realize that society has become hopelessly sinful and that our hearts need to be made new by being cleansed from sin. A true revival starts with the realization that our sinfulness has caused us to stray far away from God. When, when Isaiah saw the holiness of God, he immediately uh, came to terms with his own sinful nature. He saw how far he was away from God. Even though he was a prophet of God, he, 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 he got a glimpse of heaven and realized that he really was a very sinful person. He saw the, the, the Lord God Almighty seated on his throne and he saw angels attending to God and the angels were crying, holy, 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 God gave him a vision of heaven. And the Bible says in Isaiah 6, 4 and 5, the voices of the angels shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. These are the words that Isaiah recorded. And then he went on to say, then I said, it's all over. I'm doomed, for I'm a sinful man. I have forfeit lips, yet I have seen the Lord, the Lord of heaven's armies. Isaiah felt he was doomed because he had seen a glimpse, he had caught a glimpse of the majesty and the holiness of God. May God open our eyes to his majesty and his holiness during these 21 days so that we can cleanse ourselves from sin. Amen? Listen, church, society is enveloped in sin. Let's, let's admit it. Uh, unless we wake up to our own sinfulness in light of God's holiness, we will never experience a true revival. If, if you go through these 21 days of fasting and prayer, and never take a moment to acknowledge your sin before the Lord, your unholiness before the Lord, like Isaiah did, there's no way you're going to experience a revival. And that is why we spent all last week seeking God in repentance and, you know, repairing our personal altars. It all starts with God. The, the prophet Isaiah had to come to a realization of his own sinfulness, and then he had to be cleansed before God could use him. Scripture reminds us that our, our righteousness, the, the, the things that we think are so righteous in the sight of God are just like filthy rags. And so in Isaiah 64 and verse 6, the Bible says, we are all infected and impure with sin. When, when we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Now, that's a very interesting word picture. We, we have lots of trees around the house, and every autumn, I, I watch those leaves just, just 
wither and fall, then we have to use a blower to, to blow those leaves uh, away. Those are the same trees that look uh, so lush and, and so green and so beautiful in the spring. But then there's a point of transition that, that comes and it's almost as if an infection begins to work gradually uh, in those trees uh, until the leaves, the leaves start withering and then they, they fall only to be blown away. And that is how infected we are with sin. We wither and we get blown away by our sins. The Bible says it is because of the message of God that we are not consumed. His compassions never fail. They are, new, they are new every single morning. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Aren't you thankful for the message of God? The righteous Job also encountered God and, and all he could say in Job 42, 5 and 6 was, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. My ears have have heard of you, but now there's a point of transition. But now I used to hear about you, but now I have really seen who you are. Therefore, I despise myself. I hate myself, and, and I repent in dust and ashes. Job despised himself because he saw his true nature in the sight of God's holiness. May God give us a but now moment as we wait upon him these 21 days in fasting and prayer. Now, if we are to experience a true revival, we must each acknowledge our sins and see our need for personal revival. Can I encourage you to, to, to humble yourself and acknowledge your own situation today? In fact, the Bible says in, in 1 John uh, 1, you look at 8 and 9, the Bible says that if we claim that, that we don't have any sin in us, then we are only deceiving ourselves, and, and the truth is not even in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful, he is just, he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will forgive us. And so if we're going to be transformed by the Spirit of God in a revival, then we, we must acknowledge our sins and repent just like Isaiah did and just like Job did. Every spiritual revival, every revival in Scripture started because society was engulfed in sin and they acknowledged their need for repentance. And let me, let me give, give you an example. The reason why uh, God sent the prophet Jonah to, to go uh, to the city of Nineveh and, and to preach was because that city had become very, very sinful. If I listen to what the Bible says in Jonah 1 and 1 and 2, the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to that great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And then when you read Jonah chapter 3 and verse 8, the Bible tells us that that city was just filled with evil. It was just filled with violence. And then when you look at the book of Nahum, we see you know, a further description of the sinful nature of that city of Nineveh. The Bible tells us in that, that, that book of scripture that uh, Nineveh was a city that plotted against the Lord. It plotted evil against the Lord. It mercilessly plundered the nations that it defeated in war stole their things, planted those nations, left them very poor. They were very cruel in the way they treated the people that they defeated in war. Oftentimes, they would mutilate them. They would just cut them, you know, cut off their hands. Cut off, they would just mutilate them when they, they, they defeated people in war. It was a city that was filled with prostitution. It was a city that was filled with witchcraft, and it was filled with greed and commercial exploitation. There's something wonderful about the Bible. It's so graphic. It is so, so, so raw. It, it just gives us out of this. And so the Bible describes the way this wicked city functions. And listen to what God said about Nineveh in Nahum uh, chapter 3, look at 5 to 6. I'm against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations, your nakedness, and the kingdoms, 
your shame, very graphic. So what God was saying that, listen, I'm so angry with you as a people and as a city that I'm going to expose your nakedness for the whole world to see. That's how angry I am with you. And yet, yet, Nineveh acknowledged the sins and experienced a revival when God sent the prophet Jonah to go and preach in that city. That's how amazing and loving and gracious and kind our God is. Jonah's preaching brought a wonderful revival and God spared the city from destruction. In spite of how angry God was with the city, God actually spared the city because he's a God of grace. His goal is not to destroy us. His goal is to cause us to repent so that he will bless us. Amen? All through scripture we see that revival begins when people admit their sins and, and recognize their need to repent and seek the face of God. Now these are very difficult and sinful times. Uh, there's a lot of greed. There's a lot of injustice. There's so much ungodliness going, going on. And hear me say this um, over and over again. Society is filled with immorality and society is filled with so much wickedness. There's no clear standard of what is right and what is wrong because God's word, uh, which actually helps us to distinguish uh, between what is right and what is wrong, is being actively rejected in society. People don't have anything to do with the word of God. The truth is, life without God is a hopeless end. And that is exactly what is happening in society today. Because we are rejecting God, we are on a fast track to an end of hopelessness. The Bible says in Romans 3.18 that there is no fear of God before their eyes. Church, when the fear of God is absent, anything goes because it gives the evil one a door, not just a foothold, but literally a door for him to walk through to create his destruction. As I said last week, political leaders all over the world don't, don't seem to, to care much about the people they are elected to lead. Leaders have become lies and they have no regard for the truth. All they care about is how to maintain themselves in power or how to regain power and then have access to wealth. Even religious leaders seem to have no regard for God's word and, and false prophets are all, all over the place. There is no fear of God. There are nations where Whole societies have become corrupt because everybody is trying to survive. Everybody is in church uh, on Sunday uh, praising God, but then on Monday uh, through Saturday, everybody is living, living like the devil is the Lord of their lives. Jesus is Lord only within the church walls on Sundays. Now, I spoke with someone a while back who told me uh, he was lamenting the fact that the country he lived in uh, was so corrupt that uh, you know, in order to get anything done at any level from top to bottom of society, you had to bribe your way through. If you didn't pay a bribe, nothing would get done. Church, the only solution is for a revival to break out so lives can be transformed and hearts can be changed through repentance. The word of God in 2 Chronicles 7.14 is clear. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will restore their land or I will heal their land. The prevalence of sin in such uh, an overwhelming manner is an indication that we have to cry out to God for revival. The Bible says in Proverbs 14 and 34 that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns a people, or sin is a reproach to any people. And that is the situation that we are facing today. Sin is condemning society uh, to a hopeless future. Sin has shut God out and opened the door for Satan to come in to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his job description. 
We need a revival to change the hearts of people. In Jeremiah 29, 13, the Bible says, you, you will seek me and you find me when you seek me with all your heart. Church, it is time to seek the Lord. Amen? And so, the first ingredient for a revival is for us to acknowledge our sins and repent. You know, repent in your own situation. It, it doesn't matter what you are dealing with. Maybe it's your family situation. Whatever it is, look at yourself and say, okay, what's my role in this? Where do I need to repent so that God can move in my situation? It's really important. That's why I keep saying, make it personal. Don't, don't just look at the next person, look at yourself and ask yourself, what do I need to do in this situation? Where do I need to repent? Make it very, very personal. I believe God wants to move in a major revival, but he's looking for repentant people through whom he can accomplish that. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2, look at 19 to 21, the Bible says that everyone who names the name of, of the Lord must depart from sin. Then it goes on to say that in the great house there are many, many vessels. Uh, vessels of gold, vessels of silver, vessels of wool, some for honor, some for dishonor. If therefore a person would cleanse himself, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, fit for the master's use, and prepared to do every good work. This week, our focus has been on personal cleansing, personal repentance. Let me close uh, with our theme scripture for the year, Malachi 3 and verse 3, and then we'll pray a little bit, and then we'll bring things to a close. Malachi 3, 3 says, God will sit like a refiner of silver, burning away the dross, meaning impurities. He will purify the Levites, the priests. You and I are the priests. Refining them like gold and silver so that they may once again, once again, which means something is wrong. There has to be a rectification. There has to be a change. So they may once again offer acceptable sacrifices to the Lord. Acceptable sacrifices, which means that the offerings that are coming to God are not acceptable. And he says, I want there to be a change. I want to purify you. So the sacrifices that you're bringing to me once again will be accessible. So the question is, are you willing to offer yourself to be purified? What do you need God to purify from your life so that you'll be a vessel of honor. Now, I want to close by inviting you to bring your most pressing struggle uh, before the Lord, and then we'll pray over our prayer needs, and then we'll bring things to, to a close. And so, w would you rise up with me as we bring things uh, to a close? Uh, as the worship team uh, comes back, uh, just um, take a moment right now, and, and I want you to think of Maybe one or two of your most pressing struggle, that, that which, which, which you know, has bothered you year after year, and saying, Lord, I can't get rid of it. Lord, I, I don't seem to, 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 to have the victory. Maybe it's unforgiveness, and you struggle with it. Uh, whatever it is, maybe you are even angry at God because certain things haven't happened. And so even though you fast and pray, there's anger in you even against God. Maybe it's some form of bitterness. Maybe it's some sexual sins or, or unfaithfulness to God and you are struggling with that. And you know, financially, you are not faithful to God. And you know, every year you make a promise. All these things are there. And it's a struggle. It's a bother. Whatever the struggle is, I want you to bring that thing before the altar right where you are. The altar between you and the Lord right there. And then we're going to, we're going to uh, pray and trust, trust the Lord. And then we'll bring our knees before the Lord. Uh, as you lead us in worship, let's just uh, begin to just uh, call upon the Lord uh, in repentance. That, that one thing, that's a struggle. You know what it is. Uh, even if you're married, your spouse might not know it, but, but you know that one thing. And so let this be a moment of recognition, Lord, I, I, just, I just want to leave.